Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Interiors. My name is Alexis Dixon. I have the pleasure today of introducing a magnificent woman. Um, she's an entrepreneur. She's an artist. She's a creative. She's an inventor, an innovator, an influencer. And the cherry on top of all of that is that not only is she a visionary, she also has the ability to play well with others. She has the ability to have a vision, bring the right group of people together to execute her vision at the highest level and give credit to everyone who was part of that team. And so she is an extraordinary woman and it's a pleasure to call her my friend and to know her for a number of years. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Susan Filter. Susan, how are you? Wow, what an entrance. Thank you. <laughs> Very kind of you. <laughs> I want to talk to you every day. <laughs> uh, well, it's true. I wouldn't say it unless it was true, you know. Uh, so, so that we get started, first of all, I see all this art behind you. Can you tell us a little bit about what we're seeing behind you here, this beautiful <laughs> art? Well, I can. The one that's directly behind me is my signature piece for a program I call IPLAD, which is an acronym for Intuitive Passion launches an inner discovery. And how that happened was because of the loss of my husband to pancreatic cancer seven years ago. And sadly, it was just the most unbelievable experience ever. And I knew nothing about the disease, but I knew after going through 15 months of this terrible, bully, and I, I call it that because it really is that, I decided that I need to do something. I needed to make a difference and I didn't know what it was gonna be. So I started dabbling on the iPad and the first piece I did was a plaid. And I thought, I'm gonna name this for Steve Jobs. It's wow. an iPad on the, on the iPad, it's a drawing of a plaid, and he died of the same disease. One of the most well-known to have had this disease. So as I've gone through the journey, had gone through the journey with Dan Mears, my husband, I met a lot of people that helped me and guided me along the way to understand exactly what it was and what he had and that there truly is no cure once the disease is outside of the pancreas. And we realized that he had had it in his system over a year. And the only way we knew was because he turned jaundice and he was tired and he'd lost eight, uh, about 10 pounds. And he was in the nuclear power business. He, he had his own company. He was working on a new generation of nuclear power called the high temperature gas cool reactor. Uh, for 40 years, and it used a helium base, not water base. So he knew this was going to be great for the world. And in fact, it is great for the world in a lot of locations outside of the United States, which I can get into later. So what happened was um, he fought the fight. He let us all know monthly what he was going through. I let everybody know what I was going through. Together, we we knew that we were gonna fight until we couldn't fight any longer. And he really thought he was gonna be the poster boy for pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. So we joined pancan.org. We uh, worked a lot with Scripps Healthcare because his doctor was there. I worked a lot with Moore's Cancer Center as I was real involved with UCSD with business over the years. And I was introduced to Sanford Burnham through uh, a friend and she introduced me to Pamela Itkin Ansari, who's at Sanford, but a lead investigator for UCSD. And now she and Andrew Lowy, who's the head for pancreatic cancer at Morse Cancer Center are working together and working with me. And now Andy Lowy is the new chairman at pancan.org. So we have a way to go with this. They know the iPlaid program. And what's so powerful is once I started making one image, I decided I've got to find out who else was affected by this. 
and lo and behold, so many people that you would n have no idea, like Jack Benny and Luciana Pavarotti, Sally Ride, Michael Landon, Patrick Swayze, um, Donna Reed, oh my gosh. And I name all these pieces and they've all become my friends. And um, the one behind me is iPad in memoriam to Steve Jobs. So what that's what, what I'll start. What, what have you named the others? In fact, you have a body of work right now that speaks to this issue. I do. Um, how big is the body of work? And um, Probably at this point with pancreatic cancer, it would be about 13 and um, but about 300 in other areas. As a matter of fact, this is crazy. This morning I came home early because a company was fixing some things on the house and um, I wasn't home when they called. And when I got here, he was really nice. And I said, well, you want to see what I'm working on? And he started looking at the art and I told him about my iPlay program and he looked at me he said, my father died of pancreatic cancer. Oh my goodness. And you, you have no idea how many times this happens to me. It's really amazing. So I've got seven years invested in this and I don't know a lot, but I know enough and I don't know where it's going, but I'm hoping my biggest wish would be for Apple to embrace the iPlaid image and to take this through their system and tell the story of what the founder, Steve Jobs, passed away of and allow the vendors to use the images of all those that I've made thus far and raise awareness and much needed fund for pancreatic cancer researchers. That's my big dream. And if I understand it correctly, it's about 55, 60,000 people a year die from pancreatic cancer. That's, that's correct, and it goes up every year. Yeah. Have you reached out to Apple? Let's talk about Apple. Have you reached out oh, to Yes. Um, in 2014, um, I sent Tim Cook a piece of the art, iPlaid, and I do all my art on metal, which makes it very different than the most. I mean, I can show you this piece. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. So it's metal. And almost every one that I do, there's a significance about it. And I, I need to go get more and show you what I mean. But this particular piece, if you notice these yellow dots, that's the cancer. Mm -hmm. And the lines here, the blue lines are the blue sky. The red background is a sense of urgency. And the neon surrounding it is the bright light in the future when we find a cure. But this just is, iPlaid is Steve Jobs. I've been looking at it for seven years. And um, I'm so proud of this. I put it on phones and leggings and um, you can order the art. It's on all sorts of things under susanfielder.com. There are four sites that you can access to see but I, my favorite is the Susan Fielder wall art because I'm doing large formatted art and you can do a big metal piece. It's the same lab that I've been using that they use. So I went with a new company to have larger art available. Which is so what do we, what, what do we want to say to, to Tim Cook if he's watching? What, what, let's, let's talk to Tim Cook quickly. Tim, okay. All right. is, and let's um, let's 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 put him on on uh, on front stage here. Oh so say goodness. something to Tim so we can get him to uh, pick up the phone and call you because this is magnificent. I love the fact that your art is not only beautiful, but it's a narrative about a journey that has to be painful, um, has to embody and accompany just you and your husband, but your entire friends and families, a whole community of people. And this obviously is something that we don't hear a lot about. We hear about breast cancer, which is obviously uh, detrimental and something to consider, but pancreatic cancer is it's usually a, something we don't hear about. Yeah. yeah. And so if That's Tim is watching, what do we want to say to Tim so we can get him to pick up the phone and call you? What do we need to say here? Well, hi, Tim. Thank you for calling me. I have been reaching out to you since 2014. And I, every time you do one of your 
uh, tweaks or on Twitter, I'm hoping that maybe I'll see iPlaid in the background behind your uh, computer and that you're using, you know, utilizing the spirit of what this piece means because I wanted Steve Jobs to be my signature piece for this program because he's so well known. And I also love Apple. I've, I've been using Apple products for many, 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 many years. And I live in San Diego and I go to UTC and I'm probably the oldest person that goes there. They all know me and they all know about the iPad program. And they're oh, like, hey, what'd you do this week? Yeah. So I use your software program called Procreate and I make different images for wonderful people who have sadly passed away. And one of my favorites was Dizzy Gillespie and um, the blessed man, Count Basie. So Dizzy Gillespie is called Cheek to Cheek. And if you want to see them, SusanFielderArt.com. And there's a whole segment called iPlaid. And there are many people that are on there that have just died. Matter of fact, I made one for um, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I haven't posted yet because she died. Mm -hmm. And Aretha Franklin. And um, when someone passes, I just make it for them. Public or figure or non-public. Yeah. How does art heal? I mean, we know that, that art is an expression and it tells a story. But how does it heal the artist? What is the inner journey that is not only expressed but received from the artist? They've done studies on this. And when you see happy art, you smile. And when you know the story behind it, you smile bigger. And when they put it in hospitals that tell a story about a specific disease, everybody wants to know more because they wanna know that experience. What did that person go through? How did they feel? How long did they live? Is there anywhere I can find out more information? And it just creates a dialogue so that people can start talking to one another about it. And I want to start that dialogue. I want to paint that picture. I want to create art that tells you more about the cure and where it is and talk to researchers, a caveat, if you will, to make it happen. You know, one of the things that, that's, that's so exquisite to the idea of storytelling and the ability of storytelling to heal and to inform and to bring people together in community. Um, one of the things I've known about you in the numbers, number of years I've known you is your resiliency. And beyond your resiliency is your will to always be fully engaged in life. And I've seen you over the years, I've known you take obstacles and turn them into a possibility of something positive to use that word or to take things that um, can be overwhelming, like the passing of Dan, and to create a voice and an expression that invites other people to participate in this community of healing and loving with you. Where did you get that from? Were you raised? Did you have parents who said, you know, Susan, you're going to be a tough girl? And did they give you a roadmap? Or what did this? What is I this wish get? that they did give me a roadmap. <laughs> and I will tell you my story. I was raised in Kansas City. There are six siblings. I'm the only daughter. I had a sister that passed away at three months of crib death. She was born before I was born. But I have an older brother. Then her name was Vivian Lee. Then myself. Then Wen, Doug, Wesley, and Ward. So my family was in the hamburger business, fast food, like, like McDonald's. As a matter of fact, in 1955, we were um, asked if McDonald, they wanted to buy us. We were the biggest in the Midwest. We had barbecue places and a, a, another um, group of uh, like 40 called Smacks, S-M-A-K-S. -S. And it was truly, you know, that's what set us on our way. But in 1960, um, my father sold the business to my grandfather and my uncle because he had a vision of taking hamburgers to Switzerland. And he was good friends with a man named Uli Prager. And he had met Uli Prager at the Chicago restaurant 
uh, convention. He was the president of the Missouri Restaurant Association in Kansas City. And he'd go to the annual events and he'd meet lots of really interesting people from all over the world. And Uli Prager was one of those people who built a huge business all over the world uh, after we had met him. But he had the vision of taking hamburgers to Switzerland and nobody has a quick lunch in Switzerland. It's two hours and wine and, and espresso and, you know, a cognac and then you take it's a, an effect. It's an effect. Yeah. yeah. And so at 12 years old, I went over with my parents to open the first Zilber Kugel, which means silver balls, a Zilber Kugel. Don't ask me why they called that, but it was a big round entrance with a revolving door. And when you went in, there were six horseshoes that seated 18 people at each horseshoe. And they trained the uh, employees using a cassette that hung over their shoulder. And they had a lot of people from Nestle that worked there. And I remember so well thinking, wow, what an inventive way to train somebody. And here I am, a young girl, and I, Zurich was the first place that we went to. And Uli took us up to the mountain skiing in Samaritz. He had a castle there. And that was just amazing. I actually went down the, you know, when you get on the back of a bobcat, and you go through those oh. trails. And I stuck my leg out and put my hip out of place. I'll never forget the pain. But. It was really wonderful. And I decided that when I was older, I was gonna to move to Switzerland and live there for a year. And my uncle Harry's wife, uh, June, said she would, she would take me. So I took her up on it 10 years later. And I, in fact, she took me over. She introduced me to a family called the Feldkalschers. I was gonna work for Prager, but I found, uh, I, another family that I ended up living with for a year and they were big business hotels, restaurants, um, confiseries and fashion stores. Oh my gosh, I could go shopping and no one would know. And we'd go up seven floors and put them in the basket and pop off. I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is a trip. <laughs> and she was American married to a Swiss and um, lovely people, three children. I was sort of their au pair, but I really wasn't. They had five people working for them. I'm like, oh dear. <laughs> so that story is, yeah, I, I could write a book about my year in Switzerland. Oh, sure. So you but were born. First, to... Well, the first exhibition that I went to was a Miro. And oh. I went with Joan Feldhaus. She was with, she was the American marriage to a Swiss man, Jorid. And I walked in and I was blown away by the Miro feeling of art because that's how I just see art, the Picasso called their Miro. And then years later, um, my husband's business, uh, he was working with General Atomics and his mentor was a man, he and his wife owned a lot of art and she's a hundred now and I'm very close to her. He has since passed away, but they owned a series from Hundertwasser who's from Vienna and they have what's called the Regentag suite. And when she downsized after her husband passed away, she offered their collection to us. And my husband was ill, but he said, would you like to have it? And I said, oh my gosh, Hunter Wasser Alley in our home. I used yeah. to go to their house and walk down and look at the 10 pieces in this collection. Oh gosh, it's, it's still one of the most wonderful pieces of back, you know, of, art I have I mean 10 pieces oh my gosh anyway so I started painting like Hunterwasser my first okay. piece I was 55 and I had the canvas given to me by a really dear friend named Connie McCoy and it sat there blank pristine like a clean canvas for five years and I finally I finally painted my very first piece it's and interesting you mentioned Miro because your work reminds me of Miro quite a bit um, Did you do yeah. that? Is that intentional? Is that deliberate? Did you want to fashion the style of your art? After well, that? I fashion it around a lot of different artists like Sam Francis or um, Calder. I have a, a Calder piece that looks like Calder and I call it Walder. <laughs> of course. And I have another Calder piece that I call it Eggs Jubilee, but it does look Calderish. Mm -hmm. And I have Hunterwasser and Vladimir Cora, who's a, uh, a Mexican artist. Uh, one of my first pieces I did 
Matter of fact, I'll show it to you. This is Vladimir Cora, and it's a canvas. It's gorgeous. And that's the way he paints. He does cabezas or faces, heads. And uh, I don't know where that came from. I don't know where a lot of this comes from. It's just so exciting. So when I do one, and this is probably my second piece of art. And then when, when, when Hold my, on. This is, your, this is your second piece of art? Yeah. The, the, no. Now, let me ask you something. When you do a piece like that, and, and, and it's, to use this language, it's finish, do you then go back and look at it and discover things that you had done that you didn't realize you had done in the composition? Do yeah. you discover some kind of symbolism or things you put in there, and you're very surprised? Can, can, you, can you tell us about that piece and describe it to us and perhaps what you had discovered after its completion along the way and along the way? Well, every time I show him, people like, they want him. And I've never sold any of my original art. And I, what I see in him is a sad face, and, but a happy inside, colorful kind of character. Um, the green hair is coming out of everyone now. I mean, everyone's starting to do green hair. But I, I wanted this to represent just you could go anywhere with art and you can, you just have to go with what's in your little mind. And I have to tell you, I looked at a lot of his faces and I still look at him. He's all over the world now. He's become very famous and he's never seen this, but he doesn't need to, I get to enjoy it. I have, I have some originals as well. But the reason I know about him is the same family that, that this couple, who the lady's now 100, she introduced us to Vladimir Kora. And when they downsized, Dan and I bought some of his pieces. And I just love his art. So it, it kind of resonates with Miro, Picasso, yeah. Calder, Hildervasser, not San Francis, but Tobias. I love the idea that you find freedom in the expression that you seem to not have rules around <clears throat> what you paint. And yeah. one of the things I've noticed in your paintings is the vibrancy of the colors. The colors are so vibrant, they're so stunning. Is that deliberate or did that just happen along the way of your art? I think I'm a bit of a Pollyanna and a lot of people might not know who she was, but I love it when the sunlight comes in and, sh and shoots through a crystal and makes an image on the wall. And I go, wow, that is so inspirational. And I think you could paint that. You can paint vibrancy. And so that's what I do. I just take an idea and I put them on lots of different things. This is called Cranky Pants. Oh. <laughs> Of course. Cranky Pants is a real Moreau looking guy, you know. He's, Very much so. Yeah, and I love the cell phone. And one of my best friends has this on her phone, and I had it for a long time. So I make my business card with that on the back. It's one of my most favorite pieces. And then I just mm -hmm. decided to make my signature my, my way of art because now I sign yeah. everything. I didn't used to do that either. No, can people purchase your art? Is your art available for sale? If it people is. wanted to on, and where they go confusing. to it's under susanfielder.com and there are four sites. The first one is large formatted art called, called susanfielderwallart.com. The second one is called iPlad. And I decided I was going to create wearables. And the most the one that's sold the most are leggings. I do leggings, yoga leggings, socks, and uh, phone covers on that site. And I, I thought to myself, what if we could change the world by purchasing leggings through and, and help pancreatic cancer? I think I put um, wearing, le wearing, wearing art one legging at a time, something like that. But just trying to be different and uh, think out of the box, as you say. And people love these leggings. They, I get pictures of people all over that have purchased them. So iPlaid is the wearables line. 
And then I go, it goes to Susan Fielder art, which is all the older art that I did. Um, but it has a whole segment on iPlaid. And when I do a new piece, I'll put it on there. But the larger art is really what I'm interested in. And you, I want people to use it in their foyers or in their business or let it be the story of what they're all about. Boutique hotels, you can, you can decorate around all the colors. There's just a lot that can happen, but I like the idea of licensing it at this point and letting them run with all the marketing. So I want to do what I do best, and that is to create more art. I get the impression there's still a lot more art inside of you. You oh, know, as when I was speaking with you, I'm thinking of um, David Bowie, and um, they said he just couldn't stop creating, even when yeah. he was quite ill. They would go to his hospital in his hospital room with his assistants and all these people, mm -hmm. and he was again perpetually living in cre Isn't creativity. Isn't wonderful that we can do that now on the iPad? I do yeah. all of my art on the larger size iPad, and I use Procreate, and I use my finger most of the time. I don't even oh, use the Apple Pencil, and I just created a piece for Cyber Monday, and for Black Friday, because we're going to market the images and we're going to call attention to these sites to try and get sales. A good friend of mine about two years ago called me out of the blue. We grew up together and her family well, started um, a very large bank in, back in Chicago. And she said, I, I want to do something very special for Dan. I love Dan. And I love this the iPlaid program. She said, I want to give you $100,000. I said, whoa, you can't be serious. Well, she was. And uh, I knew exactly. She said, I want you to, to decide where it goes. And so I called the chancellor at UCSD. Pradeep. Yeah, Pradeep. And I said, I want to designate these funds for you. I just received oh, an honor of $100,000 from a friend of mine. I'd like to give Sanford Burnham 50000 for... Uh, but, you know, uh, and, uh, Pamela Aiken and sorry. And I want to give Andrew Lowy at Moore's Cancer Center at UCSD the other 50000 And by the way, it will be reoccurring. And he was thrilled, to say the least. By the way, I think he was in India when I called him. <laughs> I never know where he's going to be. But, you know, the fact that he was open to my iPlaid program. As a matter of fact, he was on the letter that I sent to Tim Cook, along with other very powerful people who know about iPlaid. And honestly, I just know that it's got its own journey. And maybe the time at the very beginning wasn't the time for Apple to know about it or embrace it. And maybe now it is. Yeah. Well, we'll find out. That's my hope. We'll find. What's next for you? What? 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 I mean, you're such a model, <clears throat> and you do it with such what appears to be relative ease. I, I'm not attempting to minimize it, but you seem to journey through life in a way that, I mean, I've seen you happy. I've seen you successful over the years. I've known you. I've seen you do incredible things in terms of relationships you've had and, and, and innovations you've, you've made manifest, right? And you seem to also not embrace so well the highs of your lives, of your life, but the lows as well. And you seem to be able to feel the weight of it, but not be consumed by the weight of yeah, it. You seem to very, go through... <laughs> very good segue to going back to your question I didn't finish answering, and that is, what happened earlier in my childhood to give me the impetus to figure it out? Mm -hmm. And I was where I was going after the hamburgers that started in Switzerland is we started Hasty House in Colorado Springs. We moved our whole family there. Mm -hmm. We used to go have a lodge outside of Estes Park in Allen's Park. We spent three months there because it was so hot in Kansas City. And my dad would fly back and forth. He had his own plane and my cousins were there. And it was just, yeah, it was La La Land, riding horses and square dancing and chuck wagon rides. And then we'd go back home. So one year we didn't go back home. We went to Colorado Springs. And 
we ended up living at the Broadmoor, uh, right down the street from the Broadmoor Hotel. And we didn't know what that was. It was, you know, I was very young. I went to a girl's school. But eight years later, my father expanded too quickly and a bank called a note. He had 40 restaurants in Menlo Park and Arizona and all over Colorado. And all of a sudden, four other banks found out about the loan that was called. And we lived in this 40 room house, 13 bedrooms, eight and a half baths. And all of a sudden the bank took it away. I was in my second year of college and I didn't know, I called, I, I went home for Thanksgiving and I couldn't get my, my parents online to say I was on my way. And they told me the phone was disconnected. And I said, that, that's my home, that can't be. Well, it was, but when I got home, we had a house full of company. We had live in help. My mother, you know, welcomed us. I was with a, a boyfriend from Oklahoma, a big oil family, and the governor's son, believe it or not, who flew into Denver and I was going to Greeley. And we walked in, mother opened, you know, the door with open arms and beautiful hostess with the mostess. And I said, Mom, what's going on? We couldn't call you. She's, I'll tell you later, darling. I'll tell you later. Well, later was um, we had to move out. I was went back to school, but I, I didn't have to go through all this. My brothers that were younger did. But in Colorado, they can take your home, your car, everything. And our car was taken. And it was the car that John Kennedy used when he went through the, um, came to the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. And mom and dad met John Kennedy. and and remembered their names after that evening when they'd gone to a fundraising party and thanked him for letting him use their car. It was a blue Lincoln <laughs> top down, just like the one that he was killed in in Texas. It was crazy. Yeah. So anyway, we lost everything. And I didn't finish school because of that. And I was afraid to borrow any money. We moved to Breckenridge, Colorado. There were 500 people there off season. My dad was running a business up there. We had a restaurant on the main street. I used to do these big decoupages, uh, six feet by four feet of magazine um, images and I'd lacquer it and put um, Elmer's glue in it, which would dry clear and I'd put them in restaurants and I'd sell them for $15 each. <laughs> wow, I wonder what they'd be worth now. But um, that was my realization that there was no health care. There was no, I, I got a car at 16 and at 18, we, we had to give them to the next child. Like I got an Austin Healy when I turned 16. So things were great and then they weren't. So the yeah. silver spoon to the saloon, I guess. <laughs> but that's when I realized that nothing lasts forever. Wow. And you can lose everything in a moment's notice. Don't ever take anything for granted. Mm -hmm. So for 10 years, I ended up, I, going to Switzerland was a highlight and I took my guitar, I, I write music and I sing. And I played on the old, in the old town called the Niederdorf with a guy from Baltimore. And we'd make $50 a night, you know, singing. And then I, I was living with one of the wealthiest families over there. So things were good for a while. <laughs> Then I got back to Kansas City and I started, um, I was told by my best friend from four years old, uh, she and her husband, oh, you've got to go interview with Tiffany's Attic in Kansas City. And uh, I ended up getting hired as a singer and we were the musical comedy group and became very famous there, three years there. And then we moved out to um, um, San Diego because my father lived here. And we were the number one group for several years here. I got out, I wanted health insurance. I wanted money to live on. We were living at the Winter Circle Lodge in Del Mar and singing for our rent for a year. My goodness. Imagine. My goodness. So after that, my I was married. I have a, a wonderful man named Kirk Jackson. First marriage, I was 25. And he ended up getting with the new Christie Minstrels. And we had gone to LA and we, we were a, a smaller group at that time called Easy Pieces. And one of the, um, the bass player used to play bass for Frank Zappa. <laughs> but in so doing, we were singing at a restaurant that Doug Manchester owned, who uh, is called Botsford's Old Place. 
So I met Doug and when my husband got in the new Christy, new Christy menstruals, we weren't doing that well. And I said, I think you need to move on and I'm going to move on. So he went on his way. I went back to Kansas city and I brought all my things back to California and lived here until now. Interesting. What, so, a, what uh -huh. a story. Yeah. Well, singing for Doug Manchester Vossers old place was really fun. And so I went back and ended up becoming, I, I called him first and I got a job there as a daytime bartender. I'd never bartended. And I went to real estate school at night and I met a lot of the people I, ended, I still know today. That was 40 years ago. And um, it really was a stepping stone for me, but it was really hard. So I got into real estate and because of people I met at Botsford's, I sold the first place I sold was the first day into one of my customers at Botsford's. $175,000 condo in Solana Beach. In Solana Beach. Is that, still, is that still available for $175,000? I don't think so. <laughs> but I was pretty, pretty darn excited. Um, and then I decided I was, I was doing condominium conversions uh, and ended up buying one. But I, I really wanted to do something more creative. So yeah. I, was I was introduced to a man named Bob Golby who had a premium company in San Diego and I was there for five years. Then I went with Jack Nadell, opened their office in San Diego. And then I went on my own after that. My and I had a 35 year career in promotional products. I, I think that's from the time I met you when you were in promotional products. That's What's right. interesting about your story, it's how it's so intricate and interwoven into the history of San Diego. You know, that's yeah. very interesting. When you talk about Manchester or, yeah. you know, doing real estate in Del Mar and what the prices of condos were during that yeah, time. It's so true. It's I mean, so from the 70s up to now. Yeah. I remember working at Botsford's and someone said, we're going to buy a place in Del Mar. And we're like, why would you want to go all the way up there? You know, <laughs> <laughs> but I used to throw parties and I asked Doug, I said, I can get 300 people here. And he said, well, let's just see. He, he wouldn't give me hors d'oeuvres or anything, but he sure liked the amount of people I could get there. I'm and, sure. uh, and I started doing that for years in La Jolla. I always threw my own birthday. And I go to one of the bars and say, okay, I'll do, I'll put this together for you for 5% of the bar, which I don't think I ever got, but <laughs> it was my way of meeting people. And I had five jobs at once. I was very driven. My father was the same way. I mean, how could he have expanded his business as much as he did? He just didn't, he couldn't put his arms around all the growth he was able to create. And I feel that way about my art. I can't, I need somebody that's going to, be that balanced for me and that would be my big wish what's your next put this what's, all together what's the next thing for you what's the next five years for you what's the next 10 years for you what do you what, what is the next big leap for you that you're that you're envisioning wow. yourself and your art and your life oh boy well i'm happy to say that i do have someone in my life that i love very much now very nice That's congratulations on that it's been quite a journey. It's been quite a bit, quite a yeah, journey. For we you. actually met walking our dogs here where we live, mm -hmm. and um, so I'm thrilled that he's in my life. And certainly during mm -hmm. COVID, this is surreal what we're going through right now. Yeah. Um, but it's given me time to put my thoughts together. I've hired an assistant, actually, who's wonderful and and a, the best friend of my friend's daughter. And, uh, you know, it's just everything's fallen into place. Um, yes. It's nice not to be alone. It's nice yes. to have someone that loves you and cares about you. It's nice to share your life again. It's been a long time. I didn't think that would ever happen. Congratulations. So, thanks. Um, he's a great guy. <laughs> yeah. so, what, what has life taught you? What, what, what has life taught you? What, what have you learned along the way that informed uh, you? I've learned so many things. Number one, just widen your horizons because they will expand. And the more you do, the more you'll learn. The more um, things that don't go right will teach you more than you ever thought and be the happiest. It, I mean, I feel the bankruptcy my father went through. We all went through that and it, it changed me forever. I mean, it, 
it truly made me realize nobody's going to do it for you except yourself. And don't be afraid to do things. Uh, I remember uh, after we had the leap of faith to start Susan Fielder and Associates in 1997, my husband and I put in $50,000, went to the bank and told them we were starting a new bank account. And he said, well, how much do you think you're going to do your first year? I mean, I said, at least 2 million. And the banker laughed at me. Well, in fact, we did. And the 50,000 that we invested was the best 50,000 we ever, ever invested. And then he invested in his own company. And my husband was my balancing act for, matter of fact, we gave him a piece of art that's a piece of glass that's a figure by Dino Rossini. He's an Italian artist. And we wrote a poem about how he handled all the figures so beautifully and <laughs> all the girls in the office. I think Wendy was there. Yes, she was. Yeah, and we gave him that as a gift and he, he would handle all the numbers for me because my strength is in, in selling and creating yeah. programs and coming up with ideas that work. And that's really what I'm known for. So in 1997, when I started my business, I was nominated for Woman of the Year for the um, 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 San Diego Business Journal and won it in marketing. I just about fell off my perch. <laughs> and then and years later, I started, um, I was taking care of a little girl. Actually, it, this is before another big change in my life was a little girl that got leukemia and I mm. raised money for her. We were gonna adopt her and she was Dick Kramer's granddaughter who started IVAC and IMED. And she ended up passing away at six and a half. But um, I was asked to, to run for woman of the year for that. And we were on billboards all over the city and Brooks Brothers was a sponsor. And now they've gone out of business, you know, yeah. going forward. But, my mother died at the same time. So these things that are so difficult are so, they can be such a depth of pain that brings out beautiful music and a beautiful mm -hmm. art. And, mm -hmm. and I think you should welcome that pain and ask yourself, what can I learn from this? What can I do with this? And that's what Dan's life meant to me. What, what can I do to make a difference? How can I tell people about this? Nobody knows about it. We have to tell the story. So that's my story. Susan Fielder, you are astonishingly human. You're lovely. You are a symbol of how to live life to the fullest and not to compartmentalize it, but to completely and totally embrace it. I'm extremely happy. I'm exceedingly happy that you're in love. And Tim Cook, please call Susan Fielder. Susan, thank you so much. Thank I adore you. you. Thank, thank you for this journey. Thank you so much, Alexis. Yeah.